Hello, everybody, and welcome to Raising a Healthy Kid in today's weight-obsessed world. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I greatly appreciate you being here um, and taking some time out of your evening to be here with me as we dive into this topic. Um, so really, my goal for today is to just bring a different perspective, to start to see things a little differently when we think about raising our kids today in the world that is surrounded with social media, it's surrounded with lots of different um, messaging around body weight, body size, around food and eating, around diets. So there's so much information out there. It can be really confusing. And as parents, are we able to model a different and better way for our kids? Because we are the people that most really impact them because they spend a lot of their time with us. So uh, down at the bottom of the, the webinar, you have a Q&A. So at any time, please feel free to write in a question or answer, and I will come to those at the end. I already have a couple questions that have been submitted prior to, so I will get to those at the end as well, or maybe I'll address them as we go through. So let's get started. Um, and again, thanks for being here. All right, so before we even dive in, let's just kind of talk about health. What is health anyway? So I pulled this definition right off uh, the, you know, right from the dictionary. A state of physical, mental, and social well-being. So we're looking at the physicality of the body, the emotional state, and also the social well-being in which disease and illness are absent. A person's mental or physical condition. And when we think about mental and physical condition, one of the statements that I hear over and over again is that my weight dictates my health. And I think doctors see, this, see things this way as well. And if you think about the people that you know um, in your you know, inner circle, there are probably people in smaller bodies that are not very healthy at all. And there are probably people in larger bodies who are very healthy. And so it's, it's pulling apart this society's thought process around the, the connection between someone's weight and their overall health. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about a little bit today because we want to pull them apart and disconnect them and think more about the behaviors of how we live our lives versus our weight and just looking at our weight. The focus today will be on like this, the society's obsession on body weight and how it might be negatively, actually negatively impacting our country's medical, medical, mental and physical health as opposed to positively, right? And then how parents can shift the perspective by really starting to see people, not only their children, but all people for beyond, there's so much more than their physical body. You know, if you think about the qualities and traits that you care, that that you care, like you think about some of your friends and their qualities and traits and what you like about them, it has nothing to do with their physical body. So we're gonna dive in and talk about that a little bit more. Between 1990 and 2008, body weights in this country have risen 30%. And now, if you think about the onset of diet culture and diets, it really started to um, take hold in the late 60s, early 70s. That's when diets started to slowly enter you know, society's realm. And we started to see more and more diets come in in the 70s and then in the 80s and in the 90s and even today. So dieting and dieting culture has increased in the 70s, since the 70s and 80s. And weights have steadily increased through the 70s and 80s and 90s and to today. In this map, we're looking at adding, they've had to add increased categories of body weight percentages because of the fact that in America, we're getting larger and larger and larger in size and in BMI. Now, I don't agree with BMI. It is the way that doctors measure. And just for a side note here, BMI is, was designed to measure masses of people, masses of people that are women, men, 
multicultural, multi-ethnicity. Um, so you're looking at a whole group of people, putting a whole group of people in one study and then calculating an average. And then from that place, that's where they're, they're coming up with this B, BMI scale. Um, there's a really interesting uh, little snippet or educational snippet by Linda Bacon, and I will plug her um, in at the end of this, you know, on, the, on your handout, um, so you have her information about BMI and some of the, you know, the, who is funding some of the research around BMI. But BMI is not really an accurate way to measure our health, number one, um, and where we fall on this scale. But what we do want to look at is the correlation between dieting and diet culture, increase in diets and increase in diet culture, and increase, they're coming, they go together of body weights. So what does that tell us? You know, if dieting worked, basically, we wouldn't have any diets. So just kind of making sure that we understand that there is a correlation between dieting and trying to restrict food and actually increased in body weight. So the objectives for today, awareness of our own behaviors, right, that impact our kids because our kids see everything. So what is it that they're noticing? What is it that they're copying? Or what is it that they're rebelling against that they notice from our own behavior? The understanding of why dieting and restriction are not the answer and they're actually dangerous for our children and then discover ways that we can actually model healthy behavior for our children and what does that look like. So those are, that's what we're going to talk about today. So let me talk a little bit about diets. And we know that diets don't work and there's more and more um, research out there and there's more people talking about this and I'm so happy about that because for a long time there was no one talking about this. 95% um, of diets fail. So only 5% work. Only 5%. So when we start a diet, we are actually doomed for failure for the most part. Of the 5% that work, there's only studies for three years. And so with that, um, we want to keep that in mind too. You know, what is the long-term study too? But if 95% of diets fail, why do we keep doing them? And the other reason is that it's not the person, especially if, 90, if there's a 95% failure rate. There's much more to it. So I want to talk a little bit about what happens to the body in restriction. Before I do, let me give you an example of what I consider a diet and what that means. And so I know that I'm just a, a small piece. You can't see, um, you just see a little bit of me. But I want you to imagine if I hold out my hand, you might be able to see a little bit of this. If I hold out my hand and I put all foods in my hand, every single food that there is, I put it in my hand. And I take out one particular food or a food group in order to lose weight, that is a diet. We're looking at an outcome of weight loss. So if I'm taking out something or I'm shifting my plan, and usually that re involves removal of something, I'm removing something in order to lose weight, that's a diet. On the other hand, I wanna make kind of a caveat to this. If I decide to take out a food group or a particular food due to either spiritual religious reasons or due to the fact that they don't feel good in my body or I'm allergic to them, that becomes a choice. And so we have our own autonomy. I'm choosing to either eat or not eat particular foods. So as opposed to I am removing with an external outcome of weight loss. So that kind of gives you an idea of what I mean by, by a diet. When we restrict or when we are on a diet and not giving our body the essential nutrients possibly that it needs and enough calories or enough energy that it needs, enough fuel, I'll use the word energy and fuel um, in conjunction with calories. I kind of stay away from the word calorie and I think about it as energy because that's what it is. When we reduce our energy intake, there's a few things that happen that are physiological acclimations of the body. One is that our metabolism slows down. The metabolism slows down enough to meet the energetic needs that are coming in. So what we do when we're on a diet is we decrease our, our calorie consumption, our energy intake, 
And as we decrease our energy in intake, our metabolism drops down to match it. So that's why weight loss is greater at the beginning of a diet and then slows down to a small, you know, very small incremental changes as the diet goes on. That's because our body is actually acclimating to the amount of energy intake that we're taking in. And thus, when you go off the diet and uh, energy intake increases, the metabolism stays down lower. And so that's why we get a weight gain. So it's really important to understand that. And the body actually gets better and better with it, better at this diet after diet after diet. So if you have any extensive diet history, it even the weight loss at the beginning of a diet is even slower and smaller, and the weight gain is actually bigger due to this adaptation of your metabolic rate. Along with that, if that's not enough, along with that, we have two different hormones, leptin and ghrelin, that we want to talk about for a second. When we go on a diet and decrease our um, calorie intake, our energy intake, our hormone for hunger increases, that's ghrelin, increases to tell the body, it's like telling you, hey, um, I'm not getting enough food, please feed me more. So we've increased our spike of that, that's why we get hangry when we're on a diet, and then we get a decrease of our leptin. Leptin is the fullness hormone. So the fullness hormone, leptin, drops off so that when we eat, we don't feel full. Thus, we eat a little bit more. Or we don't feel full because that, that leptin hormone is not firing and it's not um, releasing to signal that we're getting full. There was a great study a few years back with the Biggest Loser com um, competitors where they tested their leptin at the beginning of the ranch, you know, beginning of their stay, and the, at the end of their stay with the restriction and overexercise in the middle. The beginning, all leptin levels were normal. At the end, there was barely any leptin left at all, leaving the participants hungry all the time. So it's no wonder that a lot of them gain their weight back. So these are, these are three really important things that happen physiologically with dieting. Lastly, there's other things, but the last one that I wanna bring your attention to is an increase in our cortisol levels. We hear a lot about cortisol right now because cortisol is our energy, um, in our, I mean, our stress hormone. So when we think about um, external stressors, life that happens to us, we, have, um, we, get, and we get stressed out, we get a spike in our cortisol, it's that fight, flight, freeze kind of reaction. And what cortisol was designed to do back in, you know, back in our an ancestry, was to protect us from feast and famine. If you think back, we, would, we went through a, a period of time where there was feast and famine. So we would feast on food, and then there'd be a long stretch of time where there would be famine before we would have another, there would, there would be another feast. And so the body uh, elicited this protection mechanism so that the human race could survive famine. So when cortisol spikes, or when we get a cortisol spike, the body actually holds on to weight, it holds on to fat cells in order to protect the body because it doesn't know when it's gonna get fed again. So the same thing happens when people go on a diet and they are restricting their calories. The body holds on to fat in order to protect, to protect you because it's not sure when you're going to eat again. So that's another, so there's a lot of things playing against us when we think about dieting or going on a diet. Let's talk about our children for a minute. The desire to be thin starts at ages, has its, its greatest growth between five and eight. And think about that for a second. That's kindergarten, first, second, third grade. This is when they are, are introduced socially to other children and other children look different, and there might be um, teasing and bullying going on due to, to body size and shape, uh, especially if there are children in the classroom that have parents that, um, that value thinness, um, because we have a society and a culture that also values thinness um, and, and equates thinness to health and thinness to worth. So it's no wonder that we have this big surge in wanting to be thin. And at 81% um, of 10-year-olds are afraid of being fat. You know, we're looking at fourth, fifth grade. They're scared of being fat. And with um, the 
multiple women that I've worked with, I work with mostly women, almost, I would say probably 80 to 85% of the women that I work with right now were put on a diet or started um, dieting or trying to alter their body size and shape at 10 years old. It's an interesting age. So, so something to kind of keep in mind. A couple more stats. Girls um, who diet as teenagers are 3% more likely to be overweight five years later, even if they started a normal weight. And if you think about our research on dieting and what I was talking about in di- um, with diets, it's no wonder. They go on, they might lose the weight, but then when they come off, they gain the weight back and usually more weight. The, the stats are... 66% who gain weight, gain more weight. That's a pretty high stat. Um, so it's no wonder that they're overweight five years later. Uh, I have a, a, a client who looks back at pictures of herself and she remembers feeling horribly fat and hating her body. And when she looks back now, and I think that maybe many of you can relate to this, she goes, oh, what was I thinking? Because she can look back now and see objectively that she was not fat and that she did not need to lose weight at that time. So just just keeping that in mind. The number one wish for girls 11 to 17 is that they could be thinner. And for boys, it's to be more muscular. They're not off the hook. They have, um, they have a society that's, that's pushing leanness. So you could see the musculature and um, strength and you know, so added being more muscular. So they have the pressure uh, on that end. On average, which is interesting, another interesting statistic. So it's no wonder body weights are increasing over the years. Uh, Women have been or tried on 16 different diets. One out of every two women is presently on a diet. 91% of women and 49% of men, that's a high percentage of men as well, are unhappy with their body. And what do we do when we're unhappy in our body? Our only thought process, the only thing that comes to mind because we're surrounded by it is resorting to a diet to fix it. So we're setting ourselves up for failure here. 97% of women will be cruel to their bodies today. So women not only are unhappy with their body, but they, they beat themselves up around it as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, as we move forward. So realizing that we are living in this society and we're surrounded by what culture deems beautiful. Um, And if you think back on multitudes of cultures and multitudes of years, um, decades before, different body weights were admired um, and found beautiful at different periods of time. If you look back on the Renaissance, the pictures of the Renaissance, if you look back in the, you know, in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, so bodies have changed as well as what society deems, has decided to deem as beautiful. And so as parents, we fall under what societies uh, or culture has kind of told us about. And so we, we act that way. So that our kids see and observe how we are acting around our bodies and around food and around dieting. They see and hear what you say to yourself and they see and hear what you say about others. Um, Things like, you know, I'm so fat. I can't believe I ate that. Um, Or talking about others. Um, She shouldn't be wearing those shorts. She shouldn't. um, I don't, I don't know why she's eating that. She shouldn't be eating that or judging other people or judging yourself. And then also what you do. Um, I know for me, growing up, I'm a parent of two girls, made lots and lots of mistakes along the way. Uh, I'm trying to model a much healthier behavior system for them now and have had conversations around that. But I used to skip meals. I used to not eat with them. I used to not have birthday cake when they, you know, celebrated a birthday. Um, and then on the flip side, I would sneak food maybe at night. Um, so there's this, you know, what do you do that your kids see? They're like sponges. They take in everything. So we want to be aware of that um, with all of our behavior. This diet industry is a $66 billion 
dollar a year industry. Um, one of the biggest, and the, and the reason it's such a great uh, business model is because it's got a 95% failure rate. So it's no wonder it continues to make more and more money every single year. Um, so this, it went from 60, 60 billion to 66 billion just over the last couple of years. Really interesting. So it's, it's up to us to start to shift the way we move towards how can I be healthy in a different way other than restricting food or over-exercising and moving into um, and falling for and diving into to diet culture, which we know is not going to, is not a, a high success rate. And I also want to pause for a minute and address our concerns as parents because there's really some concerns as parents. Yes, it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to be able to teach our children, right? How to eat, what to eat, what's, what's healthy, what's not healthy, what, you know, teach our kids about food. And our thoughts are that being overweight is not healthy. And I will tell you that body weights, healthy body weights can run a, a really large spectrum. Um, just because someone is in a larger body doesn't mean that they're not healthy and doesn't mean that their, um, their behaviors don't support their health. So it's just, um, these, are, these are kind of our own, our own concerns come, yeah, it's my responsibility. Um, they shouldn't be overweight. I need to teach them when to eat and how to eat. And I want to take this information and then look at it from a different perspective and how can we do this with a, in a different way. Before I dive into, now that we kind of have this backing of, uh, of diet culture, diet, um, the diet industry, and um, I, we call it society's thin ideal, and we have an understanding of why diets don't work, we're like, okay, well, what do we do? And so this is a little bit about me and my professional life. My professional life had uh, made a great big change about six years ago. Um, and these are, these are the things, the, the ways that I have shifted my own thinking and shifted the way I look at bodies and I look at exercise and I look at food and eating. And so these are some of my, you know, my resume, my professional resume. I'm a lifestyle strategist. I work a lot with um, taking care of yourself, self-care, intuitive eating, uh, some eating disorder. Um, I, I do have my eating disorder specialist. Uh, I call myself a movement and play expert. I spent many years in fitness uh, and that was destructive to many, many people. And so now it's about movement and play. And then also the way we talk to ourselves. Um, so I'm a self-talk, a certified self-talk trainer and a body image coach. So this is my professional side. But my personal side, like really who I am, is why this whole topic is so, I'm so passionate about it and how um, my mission is to change the way people think about bodies and body size and about food and about eating and about exercise and about self-care um, and about self-talk. It's, it's this, we have come to this place um, because we're living in this time frame and in this society with social media and with um, ideals a certain way. And my, I fell into the category of my first diet being at 10 years old. And the story I tell about this is it's no wonder I started to diet at 10 years old because, number one, I was teased a little bit in school. I didn't look like the other girls. I was kind of a tomboy. And I was heavier. I was stocky. Um, and so I was teased. And I had a they, you know, the boys had a little nickname for me and, the, you know, my brother's friends. And at that same time frame, my mom took me to the doctor, I was heading into junior high, so um, I had already started looking at what I was eating and started not eating as much, um, trying to shrink my body, trying to be somebody different. And the doctor told my mom that, uh, you know, you better watch what she eats because she's on the top of the scale. And so all of a sudden I come home into more of a restricted environment. My brother gets to eat whatever he wants. I have a little bit more restriction. So it's just proof that, yeah, I am fat. Yeah, I do need to go on a diet. Yep, I should lose weight. And so because of kind of the circumstances, 
of my upbringing, both in the, in the home, I'll talk a little bit about that later, um, but also in the school, I ended up, um, after my first diet, dieting again and landing in the hospital with anorexia nervosa, fighting three years with that disease um, in the 70s when really no one knew what anorexia nervosa was. So my seventh to 10th grade, I have very little recollection because I was fighting, um, fighting myself and not eating. Um, and like I said, really struggling. When I came out of that though, between then I went into fitness to, to maintain my weight, to make sure that I could remain, um, thinking that that was a way if I'm at least exercising, then I'll, um, I can control my weight. My, the, the next 30 years, I went into fitness and that was basically fed my disorder. So I had um, exercise bulimia, which led to some binge eating until, and this is the breaking point, until about six years ago when I was actually lying in a hospital bed. I had a bad knee ready to get my leg broken so that they could straighten out my leg because my knee was so bad, so that I could continue to pound on it, so that I could continue to run, so that I could continue to teach um, group exercise in order to keep my weight down. And when the doctor came in and said, you know, I just want to tell you that if we get in there and the knee's too bad, you know, we're not going to be able to do anything. Um, we're just going to be able to clean it up and, you know, we'll have to try something different. Uh, I knew, I turned to my husband at the time and I said, I knew they're, they're not going to be able to do it. I was angry, I was scared, um, I was frustrated, and I was sad. And when I went home, because I couldn't do it, I had to, it, it was kind of this space of, what am I doing, number one? Why am I doing this? How long do I want to continue to do this? And I just realized I was tired, so I started to do a lot of self-discovery. And this is where I pulled out of it and, and dove into the research and dove into learning more about how did I get into this place? How have I spent my whole life, 40 years, searching for the quick fix or trying to be a body that my body just, a body size that my body just didn't want to be? So that's why this is so important to me. So I wanted to share a little bit of my story so you kind of get a, a feeling of who I am and why I think that these things are important. So children who grow up in an environment where one or both parents value or embrace these things, right? So dieting, so if parents are embracing diets or dieting or on diets um, and restriction, they classify foods. That's, not a, that's a bad food. This is a good food because that equates to with a child, good food, I'm good, bad food, I'm bad. So that's just something to a side note. Um, who embrace weight loss and being thin. So if they I idealize smaller bodies and being thin, usually what happens to children who grow up in that, those environments, they take two different pathways. Not all, but these are the two most prominent pathways that are taken. The first one is the chronic dieter. Chronic dieter is the up and down, the yo-yoer. So they um, are always on a diet or they're off a diet. They're always trying to change their body their metabolic system is pretty messed up and their leptin and ghrelin um, delivery systems aren't working properly either. So that's why they're always going up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, and then there's also, we call the chronic rebel rebeller. If kids are told you can't eat this, you can't eat that, don't, you know, there's this inner autonomy that children just have, I mean, we all have it don't tell me what to do. You know, I mean, I have it now today. If somebody says, you know, don't, you can't do that or don't do that. You know, I'm going to try to say, well, you can't tell me what I can and can't do. Right. So there's that little inner rebellion person and kids will do the same thing. I think about, you know, if a, if a 16 year old um, girl comes home with a boyfriend and introduces him, him to the parents. And when he leaves, the parents say, don't you ever see him again? That's a, a 16 year old. If they're in this rebeller kind of phase, they're going to do whatever they can to see him because they were told not to, even if they didn't like him all that much. So there's this don't tell me what to do. Um, when it comes to the chronic rebeller around food, they'll sneak food because if 
foods are told you can't eat that they'll sneak food um, and just trying to own their their personal autonomy don't tell me what to do and I think about a, a little a little kid or a teenager putting their hands on their hips and saying no I'm gonna do it my way so these are the two pathways that we take and it's interesting because if you think about babies are uh, the disconnection with food starts so early. So I want to share a little bit about if we've got these two pathways due to dieting, where did it come from? Because if we can catch it in the beginning, then we are so much further ahead. And so the disconnection starts really, really early. If you think about children, um, toddlers who are hungry, if they ask for something to eat at 5 p.m. and dinner's at 6, you know, parents are usually, no, we don't want you to ruin your dinner. Um, and that becomes a child's, the, that's the start of a disconnection of their true hunger. They're feeling true hunger, but then they're told they're not, they can't satisfy that hunger. They sit down to eat a meal. They eat what they want. They're full, but there's still food on their plate. And parent, parents will say, finish your plate. So there's a di disconnection from their own internal guidance system of fullness too. So it becomes, we become disassociated with our own true hunger and our own true fullness. The other side to that is that food is used very often as punishment or reward. Um, a child falls off a, a bike and is crying. Um, a, uh, the parent gives them a cookie to calm them down. Um, if a, a child is in the grocery store and um, throwing a little fit, a parent will put you know, little, I think about the Cheerios that they put on their, on their tray to quiet them down or to keep them occupied. And so these are, this is actually disconnection to actual physical hunger um, and fullness. It's, it's used as comfort, used as reward, um, get good grades on a test. You can, um, we'll take you out to dinner or we'll go get ice cream um, or punishment. No, you have to finish your dinner before you can have dessert. So we're completely disconnected with our own internal guidance system. And that's where we can actually start to shift the conversation and start to get more connected with our kids and our children's own inner, um, inner hunger signals and our own uh, inner hunger signals as well as our, our own fullness signals. So what do we do? I'm gonna go through a, a series of different things that we can do here. First, you can learn to trust your and your children's inner food compass. What does hunger feel like? What does fullness feel like? What does, what does satisfaction feel like for me versus you? Um, in intuitive eating, they use a continuum, one being really, really hungry and 10 being really, really full. I mean, for many people, we know real hunger and we know real fullness, but we have a hard time with the nuances in between. Ideally, we want to eat, eat around a three and to stop eating around a seven or eight. Um, but it's, it's testing and, and starting to listen to our bodies more to understand your, um, your hunger and your fullness. A question that came in earlier was, you know, my three-year-old right at bedtime comes and says he's hungry. And I'm not sure if he's hungry, if he's actually hungry or if he's just asking for food to avoid going to bed. And I said, it's a great question, right? And that can be a little bit tricky. But are you able to ask the three-year-old, what does hunger feel like? How do you know you're hungry? How does it feel to be hungry? Because that's a really good question. It's a great question for all of our kids. So trusting your own and your child's inner compass. And then encouraging yourself and your kids um, to tune into what their bodies need, both physical hunger and fullness, and then also emotional. Um, if, a, if a child is sad or if a child is lonely or bored um, or disappointed or frustrated or angry, a lot of those emotions are hard to feel. And so food comforts and calms, especially if there's been a train of that going on. If there's sadness in, um, as a little kid and they're given you know, food to satisfy or to quiet or to, to feel more comfortable, they will continue that pattern. So it's getting in touch with emotions and 
if they're turning to food for an emotion instead of, okay, well, what, how can we deal with the emotion? You know, with sadness, can we cry? With boredom, can we find something to do that's, that's more fun? So it's taking the emotion and filling the actual need versus filling the need with food. Serve a variety of foods. Um, giving choices. If uh, a child eats one vegetable, yay, a child eats one vegetable, as opposed to I can't get them to eat any more. Um, it's, a, it's a celebration of what they will eat. We want them to eat food. We can give them the foods that they like and they'll enjoy. Um, and they're more apt to not be foraging or utilizing um, food as, as a reward or punishment later on in life. So it's serving a variety so that they get a variety of foods um, to offer some independence of choice for yourself. So if you can try new foods, um, and, uh, and saying that this is a new food, I've never tried this before, let's try it together. That becomes a shared experience. Um, Jerry Seinfeld's wife wrote a great recipe book with utilizing uh, fruits and vegetables in lots of different, in lots of different forms. So those are, there's some ways that we can get children to get some more nutrients if we're creative. So that can be a, um, something to, to think about as well. Modeling self-compassion and self-kindness towards yourself. So thinking about how do you talk to yourself? How do you um, move through your day? Um, do you say out loud if you drop something, I'm so stupid or I'm so clumsy versus, oh, I dropped something, you know, um, that's okay. I must be anxious or whatever it is but it's a more self-compassionate, self-kindness towards self versus a beating up of self. Really important to model this because children don't hear these, this kind of language. I'm doing the best I can. Um, I'm very, I'm, I have strong legs. Uh, I, those, kind of, those kind of thoughts. Um, I'm a good person. I'm a caring person. I'm a loving person. I'm a good friend. You know, self thinking about how you can talk to yourself and soothe yourself and be kind to yourself versus beating yourself up. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about how you talk to yourself or act when you are with family or friends, because sometimes different people come out um, when you're with other people. So growing up with the two girls when they were younger my brother had extremely different rules around food and eating for his kids. And so when we came together, my girls weren't allowed certain things um, because I didn't want to cause any rifts with my brother's kids. But also I think I didn't want, you know, I was worried about what he would think of me if I allowed certain things. So then kids get confused as to what's, you know, what, what's right, what's wrong when, when there's different rules in different situations. Or if you're with other people and there's conversation around um, how people look, the conversation goes to, you know, who's gained weight or who hasn't or um, who should be eating this or they shouldn't be eating this or who's on a diet. So there's just, you know, being aware of those kind of conversations and realizing your own talks. I think we talked a little bit about that. This is something that I, I wanna talk a little bit more about um, how often you're commenting or complimenting other people's weight. Um, there's a, a, a great writer wrote a little story about coming home from college and um, she had lost weight due to, some, due to the stress of her year at college, but the only thing people noticed and the only thing people commented on was her weight and the weight loss and oh, how great she looked and never even really asked about how college was, that she had joined a group or a club, that she had um, gotten an A on a, on a paper that she was really proud of. She wasn't able to even share some of those things because everybody's focus was on weight. And so I'm going to share a couple of other things that, we, you know, how, how do you um, 
talk to people who've lost weight because that's that's buying into this society's thin ideal, thinking that, oh, if they've lost weight, everything is okay. And we really don't know their whole story. They could have lost weight due to, due to um, a stressful situation, due to medication, due to a sickness or an illness. And yet we jump on it as, hey, what, you know, what you've been doing, you look awesome. Um, so some of the other things that we can say is, oh, you look so happy. Um, it's great to see you. Oh, I love how passionate you are about such and such topic. Um, oh, you continue to inspire me when I see these posts on Facebook or whatever. Um, your knowledge around cooking has really helped me or, you know, it can be anything. Um, I love the energy that you bring into a room. Your laugh is contagious. Um, I am so lucky to have you as a friend or a partner. Uh, and oh boy, the world needs more people like you. So there's just some different ways that we can talk to people other than how they look in their physical body. This physical body is just a vessel. It's just a vessel we move through our life with. It's not, um, it doesn't define our worthiness or it doesn't define our health, just the size of it to really think about that. And genetically, we're all going to be very, very different. And with that said, side note, since I do that, right? The little side note, how can we compare ourselves to others when we're all genetically completely different? We've all had different experiences. We've all lived different lives. It's just apples to oranges to compare ourselves to anybody else. So let's share a little bit more research. Um, being punished and singled out because of weight and body size can lead to overeating, restriction, binging, hiding food, um, and dieting. So being punished or singled out um, means being punished for eating, which can send a lot of different messages, um, or being singled out. You can only have, I have a, a, one client who was allowed one or two cookies where the rest of the family could eat as many as they wanted. So she was singled out because of her body size and the weight, the weight of her body. So if you, if you single out one particular person, so I was singled out to um, in my environment, and I know many others ha were, were taught the same. They had different rules. So there were different rules that applied to them versus other, the other people in their family, which just sends the message to that child that they're not good enough as they are, um, that there's something wrong with them. Um, and one of the questions that came in earlier, which was a great question, if you have a child that's an, in a bigger body, you know, what do you do? Does the whole, you know, the, do you have to change the whole family? And it's, you absolutely want to keep the same rules for everybody. And you can have more conversations around, you know, true hunger and true fullness. And how does that feel? And you can have conversations around emotions. You know, are, are any of your kids turning to food? for certain emotions or to be comforted or to look for food for reward um, or, or utilizing, you know, are they punishing themselves with food? Uh, so it's more opening conversations. If you have a child that's in a larger weight, they're just in a larger body. That's all there is to it. If you find they're, they're sneaking food or eating, eat, you know, eating more, then that's where you talk to them about their hunger and their fullness and talk to them about their emotions. And maybe that's where you do go see somebody. If, because there might be something going on with them. Um, but they may just be in a larger body too. So it's trying to still keep the rules the same for the whole family. A child who's being restricted also will these, develop these feelings of shame or guilt, um, depression. They'll feel deprived, um, which can kind of turn into resentment and anger. Um, full-on isolation and shame pulls pulls kids into that more depressed state because they're not because of the size of their body they're being told that they're not good enough as they are and I think that's the real key here to, to remember so as we go on there's a few let me just kind of wrap up here with these these five key tips to take home with you. And the biggest tip of all, lead by example, be a role model. 
model yourself healthy, non-judgmental, curious behavior around food. Try new foods. Um, how, like, um, be curious about how your family responds to different foods. How do you how do you move through the world with your body? So, with that said, what's your own relationship? What's your own relationship with your body? And um, because the biggest thing we can do as parents is make peace ourselves with food and eating and weight. If you're always trying to change your weight, you're sending a signal to your kids that you're not, that it's, it's uh, improper to live in the body that you have and you're not worth it. And so really thinking about what is your own relationship and if you can start to make peace with your own relationship with food and eating and body, that's going to filter down. If we're going to shut out and change the conversation from the outside world and start to bring it in to our own relationship with ourselves. Promoting self-acceptance and body acceptance. So really thinking about how, you know, this is kind of keying into your own biases. What, how do you respond to someone in a larger body? Or how do you respond to someone in a smaller body? Um, and what does that, what is the child's atmosphere like? So, so I'll just say, um, not only myself, but many of my clients have talked to me about um, their dads or their moms commenting on other women. Um, and so, of course, I'm, I'm speaking about girls, but this can be about, about boys as well. So just kind of translated in that um, a father might Google, Google, <laughs> um, what's the word? Like, um, I guess it is Googling, like looking at, you know, if a, a woman walks by and they, and they, their head turns and watches, um, or they comment, boy, she's got great legs or what a um, beautiful figure she has. Um, things like that. They're coming, commenting on the shape of the body as a child. We take it like that's what the ideal is and in order to get love from dad. I should look like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, that's the way I kind of felt with uh, my, my dad as far as him looking at women in a different way. And I was more of a tomboy and stocky, so I was never measuring up. I was trying to figure out how to look a certain way because of that. So thinking about those things. And then the other thing, this is checking in with our own biases, right? Um, do you attach labels to people who are in bigger bodies? You know, there's, there's labels that get attached to someone who's in a larger body. They must be lazy. They must have no willpower. Um, they, must, they don't have any control. Um, they must eat just junk all day. And that's far, the farthest thing from the truth, right? So this promoting self-acceptance and body acceptance is, is really checking in with our own biases and saying, you know what? Everybody's different and accepting everybody for who they are versus what they look like. Um, we can choose to appreciate people even if we don't necessarily agree with other parts of their personality. We can accept them as who they are as opposed to um, judging, criticizing, um, and, and blaming or shaming others because it just, it just really impacts us. Uh, and develop a supportive language around food, eating weight and body so you can navigate conversations with each other. Um, if you go to shapingperspectives.com um, and go over to our blogs, I have a, a great blog that will support this. Um, the mother and daughter um, body and body relationship. So. So check that out. Um, intuitive eating has a has a chapter on developing um, intuitive eating for children and supportive language around that. Um, and Ellen Satter has some information around eating and food and kids. So developing a supportive language so that you open up conversations around this 
ask your kids, what does it feel like to be hungry? Ask your kids um, if they're sad or how they feel, or does that feel good or does that feel bad? So thinking about how you can start, start the conversation. And then lastly, love them no matter what, no matter what size body they're in, um, no matter what choices they may make. You know, those are, if we can love them no matter what, it becomes, then there's that, there's the space of unconditional love, right? And then it doesn't matter what size body they're in. They know that, that you love them no matter what. Um, so um, open up for a few more questions. If people have questions, remember you can just pop in below and you can, um, put in uh, in the Q&A, you can write one right in there. So um, feel free to do that. And lastly, you know, thinking about just breaking this cycle. Uh, for a lot of us, our parents dieted, their parents dieted, or their parents idealized um, dieting or the thin ideal um, or being in a smaller body. So if you are interested in having a conversation around this, um, feel free to email me at annie at shapingperspectives.com um, and we can we can set up a free conversation and talk a little bit more about this and let's break the cycle. So thank you very much for watching. I am going to stop the share now and come back. Um, I greatly appreciate you all being here. If you have questions, please drop them in um, and then we will finish up. So a question coming in about um, if you think uh, your child might have an eating disorder, that that's where you, you know, I, I, am, I, get, I get a little, I'm so grateful for my mom for noticing something was going on with me and then making an effort to find out what she could do about it. There's lots of support groups out there to help. Um, so I would reach out to a professional eating disorder professional to find out what's going on for a consult and see what's happening because that's not something you want to take lightly. So great question. Thank you for asking that. Okay. No, no. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, thank you all for being here. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions or other comments that you want to reach out to me, please feel free to do that. Annie at shapingperspectives.com. Thanks again for taking the time today.